Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices, is made possible in part by Allstate and CIBC. Good evening y bienvenidos to Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices. I'm Alex Hernandez of Univision Chicago Primera Hora, which airs every weekday morning at 5 and 6. Thank you for sharing part of your weekend with us on the show tonight. A tent encampment in Avondale neighborhood has become the center of controversy over how Chicago treats its residents experiencing homelessness. Latinos are much more likely to develop Alzheimer's than non-Latino whites, but less likely to seek help. We explore why. An artist looks back at his personal and professional growth in a new exhibit. Your gelatin is your blank canvas to so create. And a local gelatin artist's jiggly garden of delightful desserts. First off tonight, over the past year, a small group of people experiencing homelessness have established a tent encampment in a small Avondale Park known as Fireman's Park. Earlier this week, the group was given notice that the city planned to clean the park, leaving those living there, many of whom have ties to the surrounding community, concerned they would lose their belongings and their place to live. The Fireman's Park community is just one of similar encampments all over Chicago, and as Illinois' eviction moratorium is set to end in just a few weeks, the number of unhoused people is expected to grow. Joining us with more are one of the residents of Fireman's Park, Juan Carlos Aviles, who also goes by Carlitos, Alice Simmons, a street outreach organizer with the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless, and the 35th Ward Alderman, Carlos Ramirez Rosa, whose ward includes Fireman's Park. All of you, thank you for joining us today. I want to start with you, Carlitos Aviles. The city did, in fact, perform the cleaning of Fireman's Park this week. When these um, cleanings occur, what are the concerns about what could happen? Um, we're not gonna have no place to stay no more. We're gonna sleep in the in the benches outside, in the, on the sidewalk, anything, you know. That's why, it's, you know, that was wrong of them what they did to us. What would you say to them if you could talk to them? That you leave us alone, you know, we're not doing nothing bad, you know, we're not stealing people, you know. As as matter, you know, there's people that come to give us food, you know, take care of us, you know. Like um, Andrea, she's one of the people that has take care of us every day. Alderman uh, Ramirez Rosa, your office says that you weren't given actually well uh, enough um, enough time, the customary notice for in, impending sweep of Fireman's Park. Can you tell us how cleanings of encampments typically go, and what was the difference about this one? Well, you know, our office has put uh, has created a very good relationship with the Department of Family Support Services and the Department of Streets and Sanitation. Normally, um, the rhythm that we've set up is that the Department of Streets and Sanitation will reach out to our office and inform us that they plan to go into an area to clean. In the past, for certain encampments under viaducts, we've actually worked with residents at those encampments to schedule a power wash with the Department of Streets and Sanitation. Normally, the city department reaches out to us, and then we do outreach together. I will go to the encampment. We will uh, produce notices that say that this is not to displace anyone, that this is simply about cleaning up the area, that folks can move their items, and we can then uh, power wash, and folks can then uh, bring their items back. That's not what occurred here. Uh, our office actually found out through encampment residents, through community leaders with Avondale Mutual Aid, who found out that two Saturdays ago, the city of Chicago came out with two squad cars, uh, again, highly unusual, and said, you've got to go, um, and uh, proceeded to put stickers on tents, uh, which we're told by our partners at the Chicago Coalition of the Homeless is uh, extremely unusual and is a tactic that they have not seen in several years, and that that's a tactic that's used by the city when right. they want to make it clear that the specific tents. Were they, offered, were, were they offered a place to go? They were just told to leave? So the Department of Family Support Services, when I spoke with them, told me that individuals were offered shelter. However, we know that shelter is totally inadequate. We know that there are oftentimes bed bug outbreaks at shelters, that oftentimes women and individuals are assaulted at shelters. 
I've spoken with people who have stayed in shelters that have said they've been woken up at 6 a.m. in the morning and forced to read the Bible uh, by individuals that run the shelters. So for a lot of different reasons, people who are experiencing homelessness choose to sleep in a tent and to have that autonomy and that freedom rather than be subjected to the conditions that they have to face at a shelter. So a shelter is not really offering someone housing. Um, it, it's a far cry from actually uh, offering housing, which is what we want the city to do here. Ellie Simmons, can you give us a sense of really uh, the scale of the homelessness in the city? How big is the problem? Uh, it's pretty big and it's getting bigger, you know, with everything that's going on, you know, because of COVID. Uh, you have, yeah, you know, homeless communities popping up in areas where they normally wasn't. Uh, you have people just all over the streets. Uh, you see people, you know, sleeping on a... Uh, bus stop benches when you drive past and this could be you know one two three o'clock in the morning uh you you see them everywhere and it's it, it, it's it's only getting worse and it's getting worse because there are you know no uh affordable housing opportunities for these folks it's like you know they have nowhere to go they have nobody to rely on one and right. that's all they have left open for. So there, more resources are needed. Alderman, what resources are available currently to people experiencing homelessness? For example, what does your office offer? Well, our office has uh, worked on building relationships with people that are in the encampments in the 35th Ward. Most notably, we've had great success at the Belmont Kedzie encampment. That encampment existed in some form or fashion for the past 20 years. Uh, when our office uh, started to work with the residents there and to work with the local community uh, around the encampment, we were actually able to move the encampment off the sidewalk to make sure that the sidewalk was clear for people in wheelchairs. Uh, and the encampment is now in a space that is on IDOT land. And we as a community and with the Department of Streets and Sanitation and with the residents at the encampment have been working to keep that area clean. The encampment used to have about 12 to 14 residents. And because of the relationships that we've built, because of our ability to get DFSS out there to do concerted, consistent outreach, because of the outreach from Avondale Mutual Aid, that population at the encampment is now half of what it was a year ago, because people have been able to get into housing. Now, the problem is, is that there's not enough housing available in the city of Chicago with little to no income. And because some of these programs are federally funded as well, there are individuals that are undocumented that work as day laborers that don't have a social security number, and it becomes much harder for them to be able to get some of that housing that is available that it is out there. I want to so hear what, again, uh, Alderman, I'm sorry, but I want to hear again from, from Carlitos. I mean, what is your take? What could the city be doing to help you and others in this encampment in Fireman Spark? I like to, the, the other men say, you know, we need housing, you know. I'm, I don't got no income coming at me. I'm, you know, I don't got no money. I don't got no no job. Uh, I got a kicked out of the apartment that I was living last year because I didn't have no money to pay because of the COVID. You guys need, you know, housing, you know, help from everybody. Ali, does your organization want to see the city... What does they want the city to do in a short and uh, long term to get people housed? Uh, you know, not only, you know, the organization I'm with, but other organizations and, you know, more importantly, those who are homeless, they, you know, want a city, they want to see the city invest, you know, more funds, you know, in establishing permanent housing. You know, uh, we would like to see the city use some of the uh, discretionary funds it received from the uh American Rescue Plan to, you know, rehab properties and create affordable permanent housing for people uh, that, that, that that are experiencing homelessness. Uh, we're also trying to uh, get, you know, uh, a, a local, you know, uh, funding stream going for, you know, dedicated specifically for, you know, housing people who are homeless. And we are specifically asking that you know, the city, you know, increased the real estate transfer tax on properties over one million so that we can establish this dedicated fund. Right. And not only would it provide, you know, you know, some type of relief, you know, in the short term, but it's also, you know, a very plausible long term solution to how there's not enough money being, you know, dedicated. Well, definitely funding. something needs to be done. I want to thank Carlitos Aviles, Ali Simmons, and Alderman Carlos Ramirez Sosa for joining us today.
Up next, a look at why Latinos are more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease than non-Latino whites. Coming up. Latinos are 50% more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease than non-Latino whites, yet they are far less likely to seek treatment or help. The brain disease for which there currently is no cure takes a terrible toll on those who have the disease and those who care for them. And as the Latino population ages, by the year 2060, some 3.5 million Latinos are expected to be afflicted with the disease. Joining us now to share their insights are David Marquez, professor in the Department of Kinesiology and Nutrition at the University of Illinois at Chicago and leader of the Latino Corps of the Rush Alzheimer's Disease Center, and Dr. Maria Carolina Mora Pinzon, a preventive medicine physician and scientist at the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Welcome both, thank you for being here, and I wanna start with you, Dr. Mora Pinzon, Obviously, there is much that we still need to learn and know about the disease, but what do we know as to why Latinos seem to be more susceptible to getting this disease? One of the things that we know about this disease is that it has, uh, there are many things that affect it and increase the risk. For Latinos, we have higher risk of having diabetes, high blood sugar, high blood pressure, and we are more likely to have these diseases that are not controlled. We know that a higher risk of cardiac diseases increases the risk of having Alzheimer's. But there are many other factors about uh, that, that how we go all, grow old that affect our risk of right. Alzheimer's disease. What are these uh, other factors that we should look out for, doctor? Well, certainly education, uh, how far in education level somebody has achieved, if they were finished only high school or if they had the chance to go to, the, to college, other factors about that we still don't know exactly how they are relevant is, for example, they have the lingu bilingual and how other other things of how we grew up, we in the, the societies that we grew, right. how those affect our risk. Professor Marquez, I read that Latino families, for example, are less likely to put a loved one with dementia in a nursing home. Why do you think that is? Is it cultural or simply an issue of lack of health care access? For the most part, what we know is that it is cultural. Uh, we have uh, data with older Latinos who have taken care of a loved one with Alzheimer's disease. And the bottom line is nobody can care for my loved one the way we can. And a lot of that is cultural from the connections within the family, those strong bonds that uh, cannot be broken. And it's also with the care facilities. If it's... Uh, if the person is monolingual Spanish, maybe there aren't facilities that can appropriately care for them or understanding the person's background, where they're coming from, those can all influence whether or not somebody uh, enters a care facility. Doctor, um, for a family member that suspects that perhaps their spouse, maybe their mother or father might be suffering from Alzheimer's, how do they distinguish between Alzheimer's related memory loss and the memory loss, for example, that's just part of the aging process? That's an excellent question. And one of the things that is important to have a discussions with the family. Sometimes it's, it's normal that oh, I forget where I put my glasses today or hey, I spent five minutes looking for my kids. The problem is when these type of memory issues are happening every day to the point that they are affecting our abilities to do activities or to get out to the world and connecting with others. If at any point, like things like, hey, I left the stove open or on, or I got lost, I went to the market and I forgot what I was going, going to get. When those things start to happen regularly, it's a, it's a sign to an alarm that we should talk to a doctor to see what's happening. And seek help, definitely. Professor, going back to you, there is no cure for Alzheimer's at the time, as we know. What appears to be the most effective way to help people who have the disease? What kind of treatments or therapies are available? At the, at the front end, I would say prevention, right? Or, or reducing our risk or our chance of getting Alzheimer's disease. So the more 
physical activity that we do, there is a lot of data that it reduces our risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. And also uh, nutrition and the kinds of things that we eat. Uh, the MIND diet, for example, which is a combination of a Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet for hypertension, really focusing on uh, green leafy vegetables and berries and nuts and better kinds of oils. All of these things help reduce the chance that we will get Alzheimer's disease. Doctor, speaking about treatments, a new drug for Alzheimer's called Aduhelm that is supposed to slow cognitive decline has faced some criticism. This week, actually, they've changed the guidance on who should get this drug. The FDA now says it's only appropriate for people with mild co cognitive impairment. What do you make of this drug? Well, one of the things is that the controversies are associated with the, the who was part of the study. And we all can agree that we want something that we can offer our patients. We want something that could give us hope. But we need to make sure that the right studies are there. We need more data on how this medication works. We need more data on the long-term effects. And we need more, more participation of Latinos, African-Americans, Native Americans in those studies to make sure that the medications provide the, the effects and the benefits to everybody and not just to a small group. Professor, we have less than 30 seconds, but I just want to ask you this uh, very last question. Uh, what help is there available for family members who we know uh, also suffer from the disease? I would say look into resources that potentially offer bilingual resources. Uh, home care aids might be available to help with work around the house. Other respite care where a caregiver can get some time on their own but really making sure that the services available are uh, culturally appropriate and bilingual or monolingual Spanish if needed. Thank you so much. David Marquez and Dr. Mora Pinchon, thank you both for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. And for those interested in learning more about this, the Alzheimer's Foundation of America is hosting the Chicago Latino Healthy Brain Summit on July 23rd. Details are on our website. Up next, a local artist explores his uh, Mexican roots in contemporary American art. Stay with us. Mexican artist Gabriel Villa is exploring both his personal and professional transformation as an artist in a new exhibit coincidentally called The Metamorphosis of Gabriel Villa. Arts correspondent Angel Du shares more from the Hyde Park Art Center. For independent artist Gabriel Villa, his work inherently is a reflection of his identity. I can't help it. Like everything I do is just loaded with my culture. I, I think that's interesting and I, I don't um, resist it, but at the same time, I'm not thinking about it like consciously. For over 20 years, Villa has subconsciously explored his Mexican-American heritage through drawings, paintings, and most recently, sculptures. Culture, depending on the point of view that's being seen like socially and globally, and also like in what type of uh, storyline it's being delivered. Sometimes, you know, it can come across as the immigration experience, or it can come across as a, a stereotype, or it can come across as a, you know, they, they stick all Latino artists into boxes, you know, that kind of thing. I want to challenge all those notions, and at the same time, I want to celebrate them. Via acknowledges those challenges and celebrations by creating works that offer social critiques or by telling personal narratives. But that isn't always the case. My ceramics, in my opinion, are much more fluid. And as I kept following the process of the ceramic pieces, they started to become less and less narrative, which is a bit different. It's a, it's a bit of a, a departure and they're at their core, I think they're a celebration of the creative process. Part of my favorite thing about making art is trying to tap into something that's not obvious to me. And I started to like really discover like how can I push 
my own boundaries of creating form and like what can like the, the, the imagination reveal to me. Unlike most artists, Via's work isn't reflective of a particular style. My work challenges people. I don't think it's easy. I don't think it's an easy see. I think you have to really stand in front of my work and try to not find the answers or trying to figure out what the artist is trying to uh, communicate. But my work is, they're a bit of a, the paintings are sometimes what I call their head scratchers. There's really only one thing Via seems to hope people find. I would like a viewer to get a notion also, this is something that I think about a lot, is like what does American art look like? Like what does really America, like contemporary American art looks like? Well, it looks like this. I mean, to me, even though it has a heavy Latino, Mexican American perspective, but that's, that's an American story. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Ito. You can actually see the metamorphosis of Gabriel Villa at the Hyde Park Art Center until July 24th. And well, all across the city, gardens are exploding with brilliant color right now as summer enters full bloom. And though summertime is fleeting here in Chicago, a Southside gelatin artist captures the floral fantasy year-round with a sweet twist. Chicago Tonight's Erica Gunderson has a story. There's no limit to what you can do with gelatin. Actually, like the clear gelatin is your blank canvas. Ah, the gelatin dessert. For some, gelatin is a jiggly retro novelty, the province of church potlucks and school lunches. But in Mexican culture, gelatins like the astonishingly realistic blossoms Angelica Aguilar makes in her Englewood kitchen are not just a sweet treat, but an art form. The koi fish, birds, flowers, uh, butterflies, bees, anything that comes to your mind you can put in the gelatin. Aguilar was born in Mexico, but she didn't develop an interest in making gelatin art until she was a young adult in Chicago. I started back in spring of 2008 when my dad was a general contractor back then. Uh, he was doing a uh, rehab in the back of the yards area here in Chicago. And there were some vendors walking by selling these gelatins. And um, my dad brought some home. And when he showed them to me, I was totally mind blown. The gelatin flower fascinated Aguilar, but she says the vendors weren't willing to teach her how to make them. So she started poking around for ways to teach herself. I would see pictures of gelatins, but there wasn't any reference on, on the recipes or the tools that you're able to use. So knowing just the basic recipe of gelatin, I did my work by experimenting and just poking the gelatin and seeing what was the reaction. Aguilar finds inspiration for her gelatin garden right outside her back door. I always love to walk around my garden and stare at the flowers. I focus on the shape, the folds, the little details that each petal has on each flower. In order to faithfully render each flower's unique frills and ruffles in gelatin, Aguilar has handcrafted stainless steel tools she calls gubbia needles. The word gubbia is an Italian word for chisel, and it kind of works like a chisel by uh, molding the cut inside the gelatin. And these are attached to a lowered lock syringe. Today, Aguilar makes custom gelatins for events, like weddings, cotillions, and baby showers. She also teaches gelatin art classes. Rinse it out. She even gave me a mini lesson in her kitchen. It's all about the movement that you do with the needle. What I like about this best is that you can cover up all of the ugliness on the underside of it. Just flip it over, it's fine. Yeah, no one will ever know. The results of my first foray into gelatin art might have been a little wobbly. You know, my first attempts at things have been worse before. <laughs> I got a competition. Yeah. <laughs> but I did find the process very calming. A lot of people find it therapeutic and they relax just by poking the gelatin and they make, you know, wonders with them. They, they come here not knowing how to draw and they actually can create something, you know, surrealistic with it. After all, what's better than art you can eat? We all have problems in life and you cannot change that. But by making flowers, you are able to have control and you end up with something beautiful and delicious to eat.
For Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices, this is Erica Gunderson. Beautiful and delicious. Well, you can see more of Angelica Aguilar's gelatin art on our website. Well, that's, uh, that's our time. That's our show for this Saturday night. Be sure to check our website, wttw.com slash news, for the very latest from WTTW News, including new dates announced for Open Streets event Sundays on State. Enjoy Brandis Friedman tomorrow night for Chicago Tonight Black Voices. This is what she's going to have, a look at the challenges black women face in academia. And the last word on supporting black and women-owned businesses here in Chicago. Don't forget to tune in to Primera Hora on Univision Chicago every weekday morning. I'll be waiting for you. Next week on Latino Voices, Araceli Gomez Aldaña with uh, WBEC will be here in the host chair. Now, for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices, I'm Alex Hernandez. Thank you for sharing part of your weekend with us. Buenas noches. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that supports free educational initiatives in the legal profession.